Hello, everyone. This is Hi everyone. This is Maha Bailey from the American University in Cairo, and we're recording this activity during my fest with Carolyn and Jenna, who will introduce themselves really quickly and describe the activity for you. Um, white Dwight Top, Carolyn Ives' quest. I'm Carolyn Ives, uh, coming from uh, Shaquemek Ulu, Tacoma Shaquemek and Shaquemek Ulu at Thomas Rivers University. White, my name is Jenna Goddard, um, also coming from Chiquemec Um, Carolyn and I are lucky to both work together at Thompson Rivers University. I'm an educator and I uh, coordinate the Writing Centre. Uh, so a little bit about this activity that we just did a run through. Um, it's a collaborative writing activity and it is meant to kind of create spaces within academic spaces and processes that are traditionally rather exclusive when it comes to language or when it comes to the kind of negative emotions students bring to spaces like classrooms or writing centers. Uh, and it seeks to create space where power is mitigated um, and where people can focus on the process rather than the product. So it creates these pockets of anti-academic writing within academic structures. Um, so we'll be creating a collaborative spoken word poem and performing it together. Um, a little bit about the tools we're using. So um, there will be five minutes of reflective writing for people to write to a prompt and our prompt for this particular activity is talking about your hopes and your fears when it comes to decolonizing your work, your spaces, your minds, um, just in the spirit of that tension between both and where we might both be excited and afraid um, of this decolonizing pro process. Uh, then we will be popping a link into the chat where people follow the link and come to an anonymous brainstorming tool called a Jamboard. Um, and we'll be using the sticky notes tool. It's great because people can add their words um, to the Jamboard. There is this creative chaos process where people add their words and then we move it around together to create a poem, which we then perform as a spoken word poem. Um, so please feel free to use this for your own context. Uh, in order to create your own pockets of belongingness. Yeah. And the people here in this room have already had the five minutes to brainstorm their hopes and fears on their own and time to post them on the Jamboard. And we said what yellow is for hopes and blue is for fears. And we also had time to reorder them, right? So what are we going to do now? We're going to all read it together. All right. Uh, would you like me to bring the Jamboard back up? So people yes, please. Yes, please. Read. And so are we going to do the random or is each person going to read their own? What are we going to do this time around? Let's do random. I think it will be a beautiful poetic reading. Okay. Do you want to start, Nia? I fear boredom. I hope to build momentum. Offending others. I hope for justice, equity, and reconciliation. Bringing Finding goodness beauty. into the world. Finding beauty, saving beauty, sharing beauty. Building community. I hope to find allies, allies. I hope that all students will forgo mimicry for authenticity, their voices soaring into all corners of academia. I hope if for- you're not through. doing enough. I hope, I hope for justice, equity, and reconciliation. Honoring the storytellers of before times. I fear, I fear my, oh, go ahead. I fear not doing enough, not giving enough. I fear my own privilege. Whiteness getting in the way. I hope to stimulate change in behaviors to reduce harm, particularly towards oppressed people. Resistance. I fear causing harm. I fear not creating safe psychological space before being experimental. 
I fear students folding like unhappy origami under the weight of linguistic imperialism. I hope to take action, develop praxis. Learning and growing. I hope for openness to difference. Deepening the divide. Bending or hurting someone. I fear feeling alone. Not doing enough. Push away, not push enough. I fear resistance. I hope for entanglement. Take action. I fear waves of guilt, shame humming in my bones. Just build momentum. I hope for I, breakthroughs. I hope for ongoing learning. Building community. Learning and growing. I hope that my work and myself can be a safe space for people. I fear acting in will nay say strongly. I fear that all the unlearning and relearning I need to do is something I will never be able to catch up to. Take action. Find allies. Take allies. action. I fear making mistakes that hurt others. I hope for allies. Right wing politicians. I fear right wing politicians. I fear, I fear right wing politicians. <laughs> I fear being too threatening or not threatening enough. I fear not doing enough. I hope that I might tap the universality in my words and that that universality might help bring others to a place of knowing themselves more fully. Develop praxis. I hope for empowerment. We need to conscientize ourselves fully. I fear students folding like unhappy origami under the weight of linguistic imperialism. I hope to find beauty, saving beauty, sharing beauty. bringing goodness into the world. I feel like that's a good place to stop. If yeah, that's right. that was the end, <laughs> bringing goodness mm -hmm. into the world. <laughs> Is it okay if we, if anybody needs to leave because we're coming up on time, please go ahead. But if, if Carolyn and Jenna and anyone else can stay for like five more minutes, I'd love to just reflect on this activity and how we might use it in our classes. Do you have you bet. Okay, great. Thank you. We also have one more a reflective activity for anyone who's interested after um, when the time is right. If, okay. For anyone who wants to stay. Okay. And yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're thinking of doing an activity like this or a workshop like this, it's nice to create that space, you know, both at the beginning for reflection and then afterwards. There's power in speaking words aloud and sometimes creating a space where people can sit with that and reflect on it um, is important at the end as well. One of the things I like when we're doing it more randomly where you're not necessarily reading your own words is that I think it gives validation when you hear someone repeating your words back to you um, and making connections between different parts of what's there. Like sometimes people read two in a row or something. And I, I really found that uh, validating. And I like the repetition as well. Yeah. I also like the layered voices when people are reading and then other people start reading. I don't think that's a mistake. I think that's an echo. And I totally agree. Beautiful.
All right. So shall we talk then a little bit about how you might use this in your class or should we do the reflective activity first? Uh, can we do the class and then um, uh, people who need to, I think, yeah, let's do the how, how you'd use it in class so it wraps up this activity and then stop recording and do the final reflection. Unless Sounds you feel like the final reflection should be part of this, like it, it's a particular reflection in relation to this. You know, it connects to the first activity we did because it's another, um, it's another chatter fall. So perhaps we can, we can do it after. Okay. So is anyone, would anyone consider doing something like this in your class? How would you do it? Yeah, I would definitely consider doing this uh, with my students. And I think what's really amazing is that, you know, I myself was hesitant, um, but once you, once you get into it, um, you sort of feel more empowered as you go along. Um, and I think that that's really, you know, quite something. I think doing it with... No, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was gonna... <laughs> go ahead. Okay, I'll go. Um, I think doing it with students would be really cool. Um, I think they would be hesitant to read. And so I might do it with like, I do a random one as an example, just me to kind of make them maybe more into it and then have them do a random one. I really like the random, although maybe it'd be easier for students if it was first structured anyway. If they were face to face, they could go in a circle. And so the order would be a bit easier. You wouldn't get them so much of the overlap, which is kind of cool online. But at least the awkwardness of the overlap and who goes next, maybe students would be more uh, careful about those kinds of things than we are. Like, we're kind of cool with it. One of the things that I'm concerned about is um, um, I probably have a student in my class next semester who's blind. And I'm always checking with him because I know him, he's in my fest with us. And I'm always checking with him if certain tools are more accessible or less accessible than others. So I think if we do something like this, there would have to be a text accessible version for him that's easy for him to look at. Um, and so either we'll do it with a different tool or have it done the day before and do the reading on a different day after he's had time to read them all so that he can select the ones he wants to say out loud. Or maybe he could just read out his own, but it would be nice if he could also, you know, he knows what else is there, right? Yeah, we did talk about different tools for sure. Um, and yeah, if I think it would be a, a, a rather different experience in a face-to-face -face room uh, mm -hmm. for sure. One of the things that um, I really love about this is a, a lot of times, because I teach academic writing, a, lo a lot of times students come and they're terrified of academic writing and it, it really makes it accessible for them. They'll come in and saying they're not writers. And so this is one way to teach them that they are writers and that they can write. And um, they don't need to worry about uh, being academic. What they need to worry about is being uh, communicative, right? They need to communicate their message and, and however they do that is okay. Um, yeah, there's I actually some, oh, sorry, Maha. I was gonna say that they're always just taught to write academically before they're taught to write. They're taught to write correctly before they're taught to communicate and express themselves. And that's such a beautiful way of flipping that. And there's some great articles actually on how when space has been created in curriculum in like K to 12 and in post-secondary um, in academic writing classes for this kind of creative outlet, it actually improves academic writing as well. Um, so it's, I mean, there's, there's a very strong argument for, for including these kinds of activities. And I think it could actually work well with various subjects. Like if you take history, for example, Instead of just reading about the events from a textbook or online resources or whatever, we can bring those events into life by including, you know, people's emotions, thoughts, and then sharing this in the form of poems that could work uh, well. Yeah, I think any social science could or, or humanities, I'm trying to figure out how to do it in STEM. And that is where I, I mean, like science communication class, I'm like, yeah. I'm for it. Let's do it. Let's figure out how to how to do this, you know, well. But I'm like, how would I do this in statistics? <laughs> um, 
and it's just kind of and and maybe it's just like I mean there is there is something that my wife talks about a lot in terms of folks um students now can't can connect the right words with the right expressions so like it's it's hard to have that there is a language to math and there's a language to how we say things and perhaps just by doing this with those expressions we could all get a little bit more familiar with how we say the words that we want to say um, but it's a little less open than the freedom of poetry right because there is a right way to say that um and and maybe it's not the only way to say that but it it starts to be a little bit more like i could see doing it for chemistry history i could see doing it for like how we talk about statistics and articles i'm having problems with how i would do that in an intro class that's where i'm getting stuck could you could you like give you know how refrigerator poetry that gives you yeah. words and you rearrange them we yeah, have yeah, a lot yeah. of success to, maybe you could give them like the key vocabulary like yeah um, the chemistry words have, <laughs> yeah like pick four words about That's derivatives awesome. and and then let them well, have the rest of the freedom I'm thinking that I could do it as an end of the semester thing, but not for, you know, like as a wrap up reflection thing. Yeah. Um, because right now they're TikToking five concepts on <laughs> in the midst of general chemistry one or general chemistry two. So it could be that it, it goes that direction, but I'm like, I don't know how to do it at the beginning. I'd rather do it to introduce something than to wrap something up, but I can see it as a reflective activity for sure. Can I, you know, those times that you're forced to give an exam, I think that happens to you sometimes and you don't want to do an exam. They can do a hopes and fears about the exam thing. Like, yeah. uh, like I'm not. <laughs> right, right. I already have a question that is like, I didn't cover something that you really liked. So tell me about it. <laughs> I never it. Or maybe you could it, use it to introduce a concept yourself and give your own spoken word poem and then wrap up a class because it could, I'm just thinking, it's a great study technique. It's about people really connecting with the material, making their own concrete examples. I feel like this is, is something that could be really useful for, you know, reflecting or for studying or for covering concepts in, in order to, you know, really help students connect with the material and remember it. Mm. Oh, so like, do it as poetry for your concept map? Cut it's like moment. poetry for your study session. <laughs> <laughs> And and they're like, going to be like, I didn't take I'm an English sure, class. I took I'm a chemistry sure class. Seen, <laughs> I'm sure I've seen people do this with rap and hip hop. And that, I'm sure I've read about this oh, or seen it at a conference. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, something. yeah. There's all uh -huh. kinds of people doing chemists are known for their poetry about chemistry. So it's not that you can't find it on YouTube. It's just how to make or how to help students do it, not make I them do like anything. It could also be really great for kind of breaking the ice when it comes to group projects. You know, you get a group to create their own spoken word poem kind of about their, I mean, people will mm -hmm. be feeling vulnerable. It, that community will be built. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, for group work, it, it could be really useful. Oh, I, I think it could also work with uh, physics, like similar to statistics. Physics includes uh, too many formulas to remember. So they can perhaps, uh, if they put it in the form of a poem, with rhyming words in the end, that could help them remember formulas better. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm going to be you. thinking about STEM refrigerator poetry all day now. Um, I think I used to have I a chemistry set, by the way, so they exist. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it would be a great study technique. I also think it's the kind of thing that um, I know it's it's not an introductory activity, but it's the kind of thing that when when students are preparing for um, preparing for assessments, although you're doing primarily ungrading, aren't you? So maybe this isn't such a, a I thing. Am. I am, but I still have to give exams. I'm still required to give exams. Okay. And I still give them like a cheat sheet. And one of the things that I'm really wondering if we could use this for is how to do the cheat sheet because they're notoriously horrible about doing very, like really thorough cheat sheets that are kind of like Linus's blanket 
that's kind of the way I introduce it. I, I want you to have this such that if your brain, go, you know, falls out your ear as you walk into the exam, you still know everything <laughs> that you need to know. Um, right. Yeah, I was thinking it would be yeah. the kind of thing that you could do for an activity to help students develop, you know, student developed questions or, and then mm -hmm. get them to answer Yeah, no, each I could others. totally do that. Yeah, yeah. no, that would be amazing. That'd be amazing. But I really want them to, I like the hopes and fears thing. I think that might yeah. be a good introductory moment, for, especially for STEM, because there's a lot of angst that comes in the classroom on those. And it would be good to get it kind of out in the open and be like, everyone has this. It's almost like a goal setting exercise then if they're thinking right. and articulating their hopes, which is kind of cool. Okay, so let's stop this recording. Thank you all so much. Thank you for the questions that were difficult that got us thinking further. And I'll stop the recording.